Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you for joining us for session three of the US-Australia Indo-Pacific Conversation Series, Partnering with Pacific, Engaging with Pacific Islands. The series is held with support from the US Embassy Canberra and the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney. We would like to give the floor to today's moderator, Karen Knudsen, to kick off today's program. Over to you, Karen. Um, sorry, aloha. My name is Karen Knudsen, and I am the former director of the Office of External Affairs at the East West Center and the moderator for today's webinar. On behalf of the Pacific Forum, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third session of the United States Australia Indo Pacific Conversation Series. This virtual dialogue series is organized in partnership with the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney and is supported by the US Department of State through the US Embassy in Canberra. In our last session, we heard American and Australian experts discuss the United States and Australia's approach to deterrence in the region. The US and Australia have committed to confronting coercive and aggressive behavior that jeopardizes regional stability. However, it is important to recognize how different states across the Indo-Pacific perceive threats to their security. While China's expanding presence and capabilities are a top concern for the United States, States and Australia, the Pacific Islands region has raised alarm with regards to a different problem set. Following the 50th Pacific Islands Forum in 2019, Pacific leaders issued the Kanaki 2 Declaration for Urgent Climate Change Now, declaring that their nations are facing a climate change crisis. Not long after the declaration was issued, the global lockdown caused by the coronavirus pandemic created additional challenges for these states, many of whose economies are heavily dependent on tourism. Building off of its Pacific step up, Australia has played a leading role in aiding the Pacific Islands, as have other Pacific partners, during this period by providing significant economic support and medical supplies. The United States has also provided aid to US affiliated islands as well as to the three freely associated Micronesian states and has recognized the demand for long term recovery in this region. Today's session titled partnering with the Pacific engaging with Pacific islands will explore these themes further to help us navigate the United States and Australia's relationship with the Pacific islands, we are joined by Ms. Sandra Kausha of the Asia Foundation and Dr. Victoria Keener from the East West Center in Honolulu. I'll say a little bit about our speakers, but please see the chat box for the very impressive and comprehensive bios. Ms. Sandra Krashar is director of the, for the Asia Foundation in the Pacific Islands. Sandra draws on a deep and nuanced understanding of Pacific Islands culture, political economy, geo, geopolitics, and the myriad development challenges and opportunities facing the region. Having spent a number of years living in the region, she also brings her, with her a strong network of contacts with former partners in government, civil society, the private sector, regional bodies, and the international development and diplomatic communities. Much of her work has focused on elevating the role and potential of Pacific Island women in leadership, development, and business. Sandra assumed her new role as director of the Asia Foundation in the Pacific Islands last September. She is currently working from her base in Canberra until the COVID-19 lockdown eases and she can relocate with her family to Suva, where she was previously based while working on a number of regional development projects. Sandra received a bachelor's degree in politics, peace and human geography from the University of New England and a master's degree in applied anthropology and participatory development from the Australian National University. Also joining us today is one of my former colleagues from the East West Center, Dr. Victoria Keener. Dr. Keener is a senior research fellow at the East West Center in Honolulu, Hawaii, and the co-lead principal investigator of the Pacific Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment Program. We commonly refer to that as Pacific RISA, R-I-S-A. As a co-lead principal investigator of Pacific RISA, Victoria coordinates an, in, an interdisciplinary team of social and physical scientists that aims to reduce the vulnerability of Pacific Island communities to climate change by translating academic research into actionable knowledge for a variety of stakeholders at the local, state, and regional level. She was the lead author of the Hawaii and Pacific Islands chapter of the fourth US National Climate Assessment 
and directs the Pacific Islands Regional Climate Assessment, PERCA, network and reports. In 2018, she was appointed to the City and County of Honolulu Climate Change Commission and has served as chair since June 2020. Dr. Keener received her PhD in 2010 in Agricultural and Biological Engineering from the University of Florida, specializing in hydro, hydroclimatological research dealing with the effects of climate vari vari variability and the El Nino Southern Oscillation on freshwater pollutant loads. They're both very qualified and please again check the uh, chat uh, section for their complete bios and impressive bios. Before I turn over the floor to our speakers, I have a few disclaimers. The views expressed by the speakers and myself as moderator do not necessarily reflect the views and official positions of the US Department of State, the US Embassy in Canberra, or the United States government. All views and opinions expressed in this webinar also do not necessarily reflect the position of the Pacific Forum or of the speaker's home institutions. Finally, all remarks, including those during the question and answer, answer portion, are on the record and will be shared on Pacific Forum's YouTube channel following this session. So without further ado, let me turn over uh, the first to, to our Australian guest speaker, Sandra. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, I'm, and thank you for the invitation to speak at this third session of the US-Australia Indo-Pacific Conversation Series. I've just got a few slides that we're going to put up and go through as we, we can go through this discussion. Um, so I'd like to actually start um, with an acknowledgement of country. I'm speaking to you from Ngunnawal country and I acknowledge their special relationship with the land and with their role as custodians. I acknowledge the leaders of the First Peoples, the past, present and emerging. Okay, we're going to cover a, a large number of topics in, in 10 to 12 minutes. So this is just a bit of an overview. So please go to the next slide. So where do we start and why are we talking about the Pacific Islands? Like other regions, it's become a proxy again uh, for larger geostrategic interactions. The region is vast. It represents 36% of the total surface of the world and depending on who you count is in the region, up to 26 countries. It's a mixture of sovereign states, semi or dependent territories and freely associated states. Pacific countries usually have more ocean territory than land and welcome the terminology that it's not predicated on a land bias, large ocean states. They have a number of characteristics in, con in common. Their economic geography, as you can see, isolates them from global markets. There's a growing reliance on cash incomes replacing subsistence economies and lifestyles. They have relatively small populations, uh, though some countries experience high population density, such as Nauru. And most have had some form of colonial management. Some uh, most have a long history of, as sites of extraction, whether that be logging, mining, labor, or fish. Sources of power are derived from traditional custom, religion, rule of law, um, overlaid with modern states' governance. How decisions are made are changing from consensus-driven collective, collective approaches more in line with rising individualism and capital earning. They have well above global average uh, in non-communicable diseases. Just last month, the Fiji's top surgeon reported that there was one diabetes-related amputation surgery every 12 hours. This is creating hundreds of disabilities every year, and these diseases are preventable. Gender-based violence is a shadow epidemic uh, with countries ranging prevalence ranging from 40% to over 60%. Approximately 56% of the 10 million population are under the age of 26, uh, and this has implications for employment, for disempowerment, mental and physical health. And of course, they're on the front line of climate change impacts. The differences are also vast. Some are homogenous, some are made up of multiple ethnicities and languages. Some are more dependent on ODA than others. 
Uh, some have significantly more land mass than others, and the list goes on. But as Epeliha Ofa, a noted Tongan author, claims, they're all connected by Nicole? the Pacific Ocean. Okay. Okay. Uh, but why we are really talking about the Pacific, Pacific Islands? The Pacific Islands is down to two factors, resources and power. <clears throat> and as you can see from this map of the Pacific, uh, it's actually located between the two major powers in the region, the US and China. Um, and the trade routes, which are the red lines uh, and very important uh, to this map, uh, you can see that the major powers are linked uh, can, and connected with the middle and smaller powers in the region. Trade is actually the lifeblood of, of the region. Um, and I'd like to also note here that bilateral investments in the region aren't new. Indonesia, Malaysia, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, the US are all long-term investors and biz with business connections in, and in, with interest in, in extractives and also in, in maintaining uh, neighborhood stability. Chinese investment is not new, uh, but it is increasing. Um, and some Chinese and some countries in the region actually distinguish between the old Chinese, the ones that have been there for a generation or more, and the new Chinese, which are part of the new increased interest. So economic security is actually linked to health security, which is linked to political stability and the maintenance of the EEZs, which you'll see in the next slide. It's interesting to note here that there is a major trade route across the North Pacific, and this could be impacted by the recent decision of these North Pacific countries to withdraw from the Pacific Islands Forum as a result of the recent election of the Cook Islands candidate to the leadership position. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So here's a bit of more of a close up of, of the Pacific <clears throat> itself. Um, generally speaking, to date, there's actually been a continuation of the regional alliances that were formed around and prior to independence. Um, the Compact of Free Association States, Palau, RMI, FSM, aligned with the US, along with um, other territories such as American Samoa, Guam. Um, the compacts are currently under negotiation and there is some expectation that resourcing commitments may increase. Polynesia has been largely aligned with New Zealand, although there's some overlap with Australian interests, and French Polynesia and New Caledonia are French territories and remain aligned, although we are seeing resurgent interests in independence in New Caledonia. Australia is closely aligned with the Melanesian countries, PNG, Fiji, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, and some of the microstates such as Kiribati, Tuvalu, and Nauru. Um, and Australia is committed to stepping up in the region. And they've said this over a number of years now that they are committed to the Pacific Islands region. And all traditional partners um, in the region are actually increasingly working on a joined up agenda, which actually bridges defense, trade, diplomacy and development approaches. Now this isn't new, in itself, but the level of deliberation and the sophistication of the joined up agenda is. Mike Goldman, um, who's the current US Charged Affairs in Australia, had a discussion with Roy Metcalf from, from the Australian National Security College last week. And I would encourage you to look up the policy forum and, and have a look at it and listen to it. And he outlined that the Biden administration's ambition for the region uh, very succinctly. It's to revitalize alliances, uh, listen as well as talk, cooperate, cooperate where we can, but acknowledge that competition with countries will shape interactions for some years to come. And steps to, to consolidate this are well underway. Uh, for example, the recent Quad leaders meetings and commitments include a commitment to health security, as well as climate change in the region. Can we go to the next slide, please? One lens to look at the region is through uh, in strategic commitments is actually looking at uh, development assistance. And if you're interested in um, ODA, official development assistance to the region, I suggest you have a look at the Lowy Institute Pacific map. You can see on this slide, the range of bilateral and bank donors and their level of engagement um, in 2018. 
And I've used this data set because it's the most complete data set on their website. Um, but we all expect to see changes in the data sets uh, from the past year as, as donor economies retract and uh, there's a refined focus. We do know that Australia has committed to maintaining the level of investment in the Pacific region. And we have heard that the US is committed to expanding its portfolio. And that's been really evident in the number of procurements and activities over the recent months. China has also released its first international development cooperation white paper. So we can expect to see the associated levels of infrastructure and technical activity in the region. Um, and India is also looking at its strategic interests, building on the close relationships with some of the Pacific Islands. Uh, Fiji is notable here because Fiji has a high Indian population um, uh, and Indian interests are in technology and market access. France, the EU, Japan have all indicated that they'll be increasing their efforts in the region, either through various alliances or directly. However, development assistance is not value free. It's not just a charitable endeavor. It is actually a soft diplomacy tool that builds and sustains trusted relationships, strategic alliances uh, in a very globally competitive world, trade preferences uh, and security guarantees. An excellent example at the moment is around vaccine diplomacy. As you know, most of the Pacific has been in lockdown since March 2020 and with stringent travel restrictions in place given the region's fragile health systems and populations with high levels of underlying vulnerabilities such as the non-communicable diseases I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, while the region's largely been spared a medical crisis of the kind faced by many parts of the world, it actually remains at risk of a medical emergency and we're seeing that play out at the moment in PNG. In addition, the negative economic consequences of the lockdown have been enormous uh, throughout the region. Um, the, the tourism countries, Fiji, Palau, Vanuatu, Cook Islands, Solomon Islands have all been hit hard. To revive tourism revenues, vaccines are an essential factor in reopening the borders. However, vaccine supply and rollout could easily be disrupted um, through either misinformation, supply um, and so forth. And that presents a new um, geostrategic flashpoint for the region. Next slide, please. When we get down to it, so uh, how has big power competition impacted relations with the Pacific Islands? Um, it's a little bit more nuanced than what's normally reflected in the mainstream media or academia. Uh, Pacific Islands perceptions of China, for example, are nuanced and they differ across and within countries. Some welcome donors as partners uh, in development who have listened and present practical solutions to problems such as sand dredging and fish processing factories in Kiribati. They provide different funding sources for infrastructure development uh, and a diversification away from the traditional donors who've invested heavily in systems and government processes so pit governments can manage their own economies. And this is a harder sell than um, more transactional um, development assistance where um, governance, investments in governance is, is harder to see the cash in your pocket than it is to actually see a bridge being built or a factory being built. Um, on the other hand, others um, see new donors as enablers of corruption, particularly in the natural resources sector. And as I mentioned before, um, extractives have been uh, across the region for some time. But donors actually need to be mindful that Pacific Island countries do not lack agency in the unfolding geopolitical competition. They are able to negotiate and navigate political tensions. They are able to renegotiate loans and maintain independence in global arenas despite debt arrangements. I recall hearing from a budget advisor a few years ago who'd spent a year working with the Solomon Islands on their annual budget process. Uh, and before he left, he'd made a specific recommendation to the government to reduce the constituency development funds, a fund that allocated to each MP to spend in their electorate. 
and on his departure, the government removed this recommendation and approved the budget. Uh, then it was arranged for a donor to contribute to the CDFs, um, which, you know, over time have, have also expanded. Dr. Anna Pals um, from Massey University uh, in New Zealand is always worth listening to. And she made some really interesting points in a podcast with Dr. Glasser uh, a year or so ago, where she cautioned that the regional strategy should be less about countering China and more about engaging, genuinely engaging with the Pacific Islands, engaging in smarter, sustained and consistent diplomacy with uh, deploying diplomats and officials and practitioners with the language and cultural skills of the Pacific Islands, and also prioritizing issues that the Pacific are most concerned about, such as climate change. Trust is actually a very valuable currency in the region and listening to views, engaging in shared values, valuing consensus while allowing for disrespect for respectful difference can actually waylay the, uh, the wave of Pacific Island cynicism. Now, very quickly, the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, this is a quote from Dame Meg Taylor, um, the former Secretary General of the Pacific Island Forum uh, when she was speaking about geostrategic uh, influences. So I'm just going to refer to it. And then we're going to get on to uh, gender equality and women's empowerment. Next slide, please. Thank you. Despite clear evidence that there is an economic, moral, political and human rights, as well as a business case for gender equality, it remains a work in progress, as it does in many countries, including Australia. Um, however, there has been progress, um, particularly in education and health, and to a lesser extent, women's participation in formal employment, as well as national policy making. While most, almost all countries in the Pacific have adopted specific gender policies and strategies, the resources for implementing these priorities are limited. Budgets for national women's offices, for example, are less than 1% of national appropriations. Prior to COVID, it was heartening to hear some PIC governments were requesting gender responsive budgeting advice, uh, acknowledging that government budgets actually do have implications for gender equality. However, ongoing gender inequality is evident in the high prevalence rates of violence against women. I think I mentioned before, there's more than 60% in Melanesia and more than 40% in Polynesia and Micronesia. Another sensitive point, uh, particularly for some donors, is that sexual and reproductive health and rights issues remain substantial challenges that uh, to be addressed. Fertility rates, especially teenage fertility, remain high in some countries. I think if you look down into the bottom uh, left-hand corner, you can see the fertility rates there with Nauru, Marshall Islands and Vanuatu, you know, above 80% um, per 1,000 births. Mm. Uh, anyway, so gender equality and women's empowerment, there's been some progress, a lot more to be done. So thanks again for your time. We've had a broad sweep through um, some geopolitical ramifications and taking a specific look through a development assistance lens. And I hope that this has given you something to think about uh, and how we engage with the Pacific Islands. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sandra, for that comprehensive overview. Um, and now, Victoria, on to you. Thanks, Karen, um, and thanks, Sandra, for that overview. Uh, Sandra so nicely um, pointed out, you know, one of the, the main issues that um, Pacific Islands are, con are concerned about uh, regionally is climate change and its impact and how to adapt and mitigate um, to those impacts. So what I'm going to speak about today is um, my research group, uh, the Pacific RESA, as Karen introduced, and the role of what we consider ourselves um, as a boundary organization, a science boundary organization in um, being a, a mechanism by which to interface with, um, with both climate change, uh, the science and work with people um, becoming a trusted source of information. And, and um, so I'm gonna to touch on a few things just really quickly. I'll talk about what a boundary organization really is since it's not a super common term yet. Um, I'll give just a very brief overview of some key environmental environment and climate security threats in the region. And then I'll uh, give two very brief examples that touch on projects that we're doing in the region. Um, one surrounding health, climate change and human migration in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. 
and another on uh, freshwater resources in Guam, specifically looking at impacts of climate change um, for US Department of Defense installations on Guam. Um, so very quickly, uh, my research group, the Pacific Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments is a collaboration between a lot of different organizations um, and a core of social and physical climate scientists. So not only are we climatologists and hydrologists, um, but we also take a social science uh, look. So we have decision scientists and psychologists, economists and legal scholars all working together on these projects uh, to really bring a more comprehensive look um, at, at how climate change impacts different sectors. So a bit about climate boundary organizations. Um, they lack a consistent single definition um, and there isn't a specific method of implementation or guidance uh, either. So it's become up to many organizations to interpret. Um, so they're a crucial link in generating credible and trusted science that is relevant to local adaptation and mitigation decisions. Um, so these organizations, boundary organizations can serve as a link between researchers, community members and policymakers in a way that's beneficial to all groups. And it's going to be increasingly critical in the region and facilitating solutions to different aspects of the climate crisis. Uh, so the Pacific RISA, we identify as one of these boundary organizations. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to provide two examples of regional engagement on climate adaptation. Um, you may remember that in 2013, the former commander of the US Pacific Fleet, Admiral Samuel Locklear, called climate change the greatest security threat to the Pacific region. Um, some of these key threats that do impact the region um, and are outlined in the impacts and indicators of climate change in the left-hand panels include rising temperatures, both average um, minimum and maximum temperatures across the region, sea level rise and coastal erosion, fresh water supply and drought, increasing storm intensity, ocean impacts such as warming temperatures, coral bleaching, and shifting fisheries, and multi-causal climate-induced migration. Uh, so throughout this region, existing governance and social systems hinder planning for climate adaptation in many cases. That includes things like the CNMI, American Samoa, and Guam being ineligible for international climate aid programs, such as the Green Climate Fund. Meanwhile, the freely associated states of Palau, RMI, and the federated states of Micronesia are systemically underrepresented in regional governance councils and are ineligible for U.S. Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, funding. Despite those challenges, Pacific Islands have made impressive strides in uh, climate planning and advocacy in the last five years. That includes the Bow Declaration for Regional Security, uh, the establishment of the UN Local 2030 Islands Hub in Hawaii, and the Kainaki 2 Declaration for Ur Urgent Climate Change Action Now that we've already heard about. Um, so when island communities and leaders repeatedly come together to tell the global community that mitigating and adapting to the impacts of climate change is their first priority, oh, we should believe them. Meaningful engagement around climate adaptation and policy is a key strategy to increase collaboration and increase human and natural security in the region. In this talk, I'm going to provide two very brief examples of how we've done this by working with climate science and with communities. And the first is through providing climate services for the Marshall Islands health sector. Uh, so when we did research on climate-induced migration from Marshall Islands, health came up as one of the most significant variables impacting people's decisions to leave. And these decisions were intricately tied to climate. Uh, this project looks at identifying those links and um, it's currently in progress. In 2019, the WHO uh, regional director said that climate change was one of the top three threats to Pacific Islands health. There are both mental and physical climate impact, impacts from climate change in the islands, and this ranges from direct exposure uh, and changes in disease, vector-borne and waterborne diseases to injuries from natural disasters. In the Marshall Islands, this, this could manifest as how during uh, El Nino events, there's low rainfall and low sea levels, which contributes to scarce drinking water and drought. Uh, this causes health impacts such as diarrheal disease, conjunctivitis, and influenza. On the other hand, during La Nina events, there's above average rainfall and higher sea levels, which causes flooding, inundation, vector-borne diseases, and ciguatera. So what we wanted to know was how climate variability and change impact migration and health outcomes in the RMI and Hawaii. 
Um, because uh, the Marshallese are experiencing these health impacts, and as we've already discussed, the healthcare systems are often under-resourced and unprepared, um, how can we improve health sector access to information about the climate impacts of climate change in the islands and increase adaptive capacity in both RMI and in Hawaii, noting that climate-induced health risks affect a population in motion throughout the region in both sending and receiving locations. To do this, one of the things we did was uh, identify health sector needs through preparing a dashboard um, and a climate outlook. So we've built case studies to build capacity for health professionals to respond to these future climate threats. Uh, excuse my cat, I don't know if you can hear him in the background yelling at me. Um, we did this by doing uh, interviews in both Marshall Islands and Hawaii of top level health se sector de decision makers and uh, identifying decisions that could benefit from climate information that's already available. So through a six month forecasting and early warning system, actually trying to link those health impacts to thresholds of action. So for example, when there is a, a, a drought event, how long does it take before you start seeing um, gastrointestinal illness, for example? This culminated in a climate and health service dialogue held in Madro in January, 2020, right before everything shut down. And again, that is an ongoing project. Um, the second one I'm going to, uh, the, the second um, project I'll talk about really quickly is our uh, freshwater on Guam um, impacts and adaptive responses to climate change for Department of Defense installations. So there is a great deal of modeling field work and stakeholder assessment that went into this four year project. Um, and we worked with civilian, military and government stakeholders. Uh, now these results are starting to be used in the consideration of freshwater management across both DOD installations in Guam and in the government. Um, and, and this was done to uh, originally consider the impacts of um, potentially moving um, several thousand Marines from Japan to Guam and uh, looking at the impacts on freshwater. So the aim of this project was to better understand um, climate change on freshwater resources and environmental security um, in the context of both DOD installations and public freshwater management in Guam. So we worked in collaboration with the Navy, the governor's office and the Waterworks Authority to produce plausible scenarios of freshwater management under projected climate change, including drought, increased heat and fewer but more intense typhoons. So Guam is a hot and humid environment. Uh, the Northern half of the island actually relies on groundwater from a network of 180 wells in the Northern Guam Lens Aquifer or NGLA. Uh, this is of note because Guam pays 2.5 times more for energy than the mainland United States due to the cost of shipping fuel. So this makes uh, the, the energy required to operate pumps of extra concern. We found that compared to historic trends, air temperature was projected to be 5.8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer, and that very hot days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit would increase to 257 days a year in contrast to zero days in the 1950s. We found average annual rainfall was projected to decrease by 7% with more frequent drought. We went back to our stakeholders with these findings and learned how to better communicate the uncertainty. Uh, for example, people love information in map form and have no ideas what shift in um, probability distribution functions mean, for example. Um, so just as an example result of an adaptive management strategy, um, here this shows a, the northern Guam uh, well fields, the groundwater wells. The dots show ch changes in the saltiness of those groundwater wells, and the size of the dot indicates greater saltiness under different climate scenarios. Our results showed that the number of wells impacted by climate change could be reduced by selectively reducing the depth and the withdrawal rates of certain wells near the freshwater and saltwater transition zone. Stakeholders also said it was critical to increase awareness and knowledge among community leaders and members about how freshwater could be impacted by climate change, especially before the dry season. So they put these in a bunch of different uh, reports and um, uh, out, handouts that were really intended for um, a, a lay person audience. So this information has been used in several ways since then. Um, the data and all the papers and scenarios are available on our website. Um, which provides project partners with um, 
data and information that can be used to plan for different plausible futures um, pretty easily. These results were then incorporated into the Pacific Islands Regional Climate Assessment or PERCA report, Climate Change in Guam, which is an in-depth assessment of up-to-date climate trends, projections and impacts in different sectors, written with over 40 local and regional authors. And through consultations for this assessment, uh, we met with Blue Ocean Law in Guam and uh, they wanted to better understand findings which were then incorporated into a bill to protect the Northern Guam lens aquifer from overpumping and contamination. Along the same collaborative lines, uh, the Pacific RISA also leads an open organization called the PERCA, which is a transparent and inclusive project to create a sustained process providing the most up-to-date and vetted climate knowledge and impacts by synthesizing the best research with expert input from managers and government agencies in a particular Pacific Islands jurisdiction. This also provides a direct pathway to communicate key adaptation needs to uh, leaders in Washington, DC, um, partly through our participation in the US National Climate Assessment Chapter for the region, the most recently, which was released in November of 2018. Um, and there's some websites with a bunch of the resources that we produce for the Regional Climate Assessment down there. Um, so finally, um, I just wanted to sum up by saying that uh, addressing the climate, the impacts of climate change is the repeated and stated first priority of the region. Um, and using this boundary organization model with meaningful engagement and developing relationships with different stakeholders on the islands is necessary for successful adaptation. Finally, what we found throughout the last year is that collaboration on regional climate and environmental issues has really transcended political disagreements, um, be that with the Pacific Islands Forum um, or different jurisdictions, people are really willing to come together when it, uh, when it comes to looking at how to address the impacts of climate change. And with that, I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you to both of our speakers uh, for your insightful remarks. Um, both of you brought up a lot of very good points that I think most of us um, hadn't thought about. So um, wait, I'm following here. Uh, I'd like to, let's see. Oh, okay, now we're going to turn to our audience, most important, um, for their questions. The instructions uh, for question and answer are, uh, will be flashed on your screen. Uh, to ask a question and or to comment, please use the raise your hand function and located on the tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please wait to be called and unmuted by Pacific Forum staff before speaking. Please state your name, position and affiliation before commenting or asking questions. Alternatively, you can also submit your questions through the Q&A tab. But if you are going to use the Q&A tab, please also include your name and affiliation. Um, and just to jumpstart the conversation, let me be the first to ask a question. And this is address, addressed to both of you. The, um, you've talked a little bit about the military. Uh, Victoria, you did in yours. Over the years, there's been big power competition in the Indo-Pacific. And it's produced more military exercises and uh, military facilities. There's been some impact, but also if you can look at what the Pacific Islanders themselves are looking at, and they're interested in more climate change health, what's directly affecting them day to day. And Sandra, you work you know, with a lot of women issues. So I'm wondering, with the increase in the interest, the strategic interest, the big power competition, increase in military, what are you hearing on the ground? Are the Pacific Islanders, do they have, share that same intense interest or are we on the outside looking in at them and maneuvering around them? <laughs> okay, Vicki, you go first. That was a little roundabout, but um, I get the sense from what both of you presented, there are very serious domestic issues going on right now facing the Pacific Island region. And yet we have, we continually hear about the big power competition in there and the strategic importance. How does that, how do those interrelate? Um, I might jump in first. And um, so 
it is a it's a it's a complex region and it, there's there's no one united voice even though they they um do work at regional levels as well so they are concerned about their domestic agenda they are concerned about their existence uh, which is around it, it's it's climate change um they are watching uh the the regional security sort of powers uh come in into the region but I think one of the things that strikes me more and more is around the need for the joined up agenda. So um, I think uh, women, peace and security is an excellent example of what that would look like. So that has elements of security, it has elements of diplomacy, it has elements of development. It, um, it also has implications for short term and long term trade agreements and it's around that security dividend for for the region in its multiple forms whether that be military security human security environmental security so the the our ability to listen um, to the priorities of the pacific islands which are essentially around a day-to-day living and the longer term existence i think will sort of serve us really well in being able to join up what that agenda looks like and and help people start to connect the dots and work in in more collaborative ways thank you victoria would you like to weigh in my very rambling question but i think you maybe you got understood the theme yeah sure maybe i'll just make a very um a couple of very short comments and, and one is building off what of San, what sandra said around coordination um and I think there is an opportunity for um, uh, different um, militaries and, and security operations in the region to coordinate more heavily in the Pacific, um, especially around um, natural disaster response and climate change adaptation um, as we go forward. One of the things that, that you see when you work in the Pacific for a while is that there are a lot of demands on um, the time and expertise in these small islands. So there's a lot of stakeholder fatigue. Um, and often you can have different international donors or um, aid groups um, or aid, uh, federal agencies from different countries coming in, you know, days apart to do very similar workshops or trainings or um, grant trainings, things like that. And so the ability to coordinate, um, I think would be a great first step um, in, in um, building a, a better relationship with a lot of the governments and, and, and communities in the region, um, just because their time is so, um, is so precious and there aren't a lot of human resources available. Um, the second is that we already see a lot of, um, at least in, in the, uh, the US military, um, the, there is a big naval response in terms of drought. So something that, um, uh, something that happens whenever there's an El Nino induced drought across the Western Pacific is the US Navy and other, um, other international militaries are heavily involved in delivering reverse osmosis units, um, water. Um, and so there, there is a big um, opportunity for engagement in building more um, kind of climate early warning into those responses. Um, so there's less time between, um, between uh, you know, the event happening and having action on the ground or getting those types of um, warning, you know, these droughts can be predicted up to six months in advance um, a lot of times. So there are opportunities there, um, as well as ability for more collaboration. Thank you. We do have a question from James Lee. He's a Pacific Forum adjunct fellow. And he asks, is rising sea levels presenting an existential crisis for Pacific Islands? If yes, what are the island nations doing about it? And in general, what is the purpose of the Pacific Island Forum? And what does the forum do? Who wants to lead on that one? <laughs> um, maybe I'll take the, um, the sea level question and then pass it over to Sandra for the yeah. forum. Perfect. Um, so is rising sea level, does it present an existential crisis for Pacific Islands? Um, yes. Um, it does, but there are a lot of um, caveats that go along with that. So we are seeing um, some of the highest uh, regional sea level trends rising in the world um, in the Western Pacific. Um, at the same time, uh, in the work that we did in migration in the Marshall Islands, we surveyed um, several hundred people who were migrating either from the outer islands to the capital, Madro, or to a couple different locations in either Hawaii or the mainland United States about their reasons for migrating. Um, and if it was environmental, what their main, um, what the main 
push factors were environmentally. And what we found wasn't that um, sea level rise was the number one push factor. We found that drought was. Um, so I think 95% of our survey respondents had experienced a severe drought within the last five years. And that was something that weighed on them uh, much more heavily than the specter of sea level rise. Um, at the same time, in the, in the international media, what you always hear about is sea level rise rise and that impact on groundwater resources and the waves washing up, it's very dramatic. Um, but in another case study in the Philippines, um, in some islands off the Philippines, very small, um, there, was a, uh, there was an earthquake um, and I'll find, I can actually find the, the case studies and, and I don't remember the name of the islands off the top of my head, I'll drop them in later. Um, but the island subsided about three feet in one day from the earthquake. And so it's kind of a case study of you know, what happens when you get the expected maximum amount of sea level rise in one day um, that we're expecting to see it by you know, 2100. Um, and for the most part, uh, people adapted very quickly. Um, so if you consider, you know, if scientists go in and say, you know, having 40% 40 le 40 less uh, freshwater, access to fresh water in, in the ground is going to be an existential crisis that will cause people to leave. But what we see again and again is that people adapt. Um, and so there are, uh, there are, you know, you can, you can label something an existential crisis and still expect that people are going to be adapting and living on those islands and people are very resilient. Um, at the same time, what are they doing about it? Um, they're doing a lot. They're, uh, the Pacific Islands are extremely active in um, kind of activism on the world stage, pushing for uh, global mitigation of um, greenhouse gases. Um, they're also looking at different ways to engineer um, their ways out of it. So there are discussions, um, you know, very some things that sound very sci-fi if you're going to talk about like floating islands or engineering um, different solutions to a population that uh, lives on, on land that is quickly changing or disappearing. Um, and I'll turn it over to Sandra so she can give some, some answers on the Pacific Island Forum. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Okay, good. Sandra. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so the Pacific Island Forum is what is known as a crop agency, which is uh, like the, the regional organization. It operates in a similar way to ASEAN um, insofar as it represents uh, the views of the collective um, body of the Pacific Islands on the regional and international stage. Uh, it's made up, um, it was made up of 18 countries. Um, uh, and as I mentioned in my presentation, I think a few people have alluded to um, at the latest uh, um, election of the, the leader from the Cook Islands as the new Secretary General, um, Palau has decided to withdraw from the forum. It is actually, the forum is a really useful device because it is that collective voice um, and it is able to negotiate on behalf of the Pacific Islands. Um, and it has, as Victoria has mentioned, been very, very active on the world stage in being able to represent those interests, um, uh, the, the evidences, you know, their impact on the COP23, for example. So they are the policy lead. There are other regional organizations, the crops, uh, such as the Pacific Communities, which uh, manages a lot of the programs that work across the Pacific uh, region. Um, we've got SPREP, which is the Pacific, South Pacific Regional Environment Program, which uh, takes the lead on a lot of uh, the climate change and environmental management. And there are a number of others covering fisheries and so forth. But the peak policy lead is the Pacific Island Forum. And each year, the Pacific Island leaders will meet to set the agenda and to make declarations about the directions for the next uh, year and, and, and the future. And that then guides the organization's work across the region. That's it. Thank you very much. We're getting quite a few questions now. Uh, Sean King asks, what's Japan's role in the region? Um, I can address some of that as, as we were recently on a, um, on a workshop that Sandra actually attended as well um, with uh, uh, Japan and Australia and New Zealand and the US talking about some of these very similar issues. Um, and so the, the, you know, I'd say that the, um, one of the answers is Japan is also very involved in um, 
So from my perspective as a, as a scientist, they're very active in science within the region. Um, they do a lot of, uh, of um, studies on um, climate change and impacts on uh, ocean and the blue economy in the region. Um, they also do a lot of the, the groundwater work and modeling. Um, so we see them very active um, in terms of climate change and impacts. Um, they've also um, been very active in uh, uh, you know, looking at education as well. They provide a lot of um, scholarships throughout the region to Pacific Island students. Um, I'd say that um, from, a, from a climate science perspective, they are, um, you know, a, as uh, uh, equally present in the region as, um, as we are. Sandra? Yes, um, I'd just like to say that uh, Japan has had a long standing economic and dip diplomatic and development uh, program across the Pacific. Um, they are very much, as uh, Victoria pointed out, engaged in climate change impacts, um, uh, entrepreneurship, employment income generating activities uh, and they are uh, a consistent um, they're consistent in their approach I think would be the best way of putting it they um, what is interesting at the moment is that it it, it does look like there is a, some rivalry with China um, yet China is more focused on the US and um, rather than the rivalry with Japan. And so it will be interesting to see how um, Japan works with allies, uh, with other democracies around the region to advance uh, stability and um, security. So it will be, it, it, they're an interesting group to watch there. They're relatively, um, uh, quiet, but they are there for the long haul. Thank you. We have a question from Jonathan Lim, and I'm not sure, Vicki, if how much you might know about this, but he asked, noting the risks of rising sea levels, how will the US, US address its nuclear legacy at Runet Island in the Marshall Islands in avo avoiding a nuclear environmental crisis? I don't know if that's something you've looked at. No, um, all I know is that it is a is an active problem. Um, I don't know what's actually being done right now, but um, sea level continues to rise and the, and the domes infrastructure continues to um, become a little less solid over time. So I know it's something of active concern. Sorry, I don't know anything more. Yeah, yeah. sorry, Jonathan, but yeah, that is a, a good question. So thank you. Uh, next, we have Al Cook. Al, nice that you're joining us today. Um, Al is, from, is a senior fellow at RSIS in Singapore. He asked, is the US military working with militaries in Tonga, Fiji, and PNG, or with other security services elsewhere on, on specific climate security issues? He has a second question. What is the status and role of women in Tonga, Fiji, and PNG militaries, or with other security services in Pacific Islands? Sandra, would you like to lead off with the role of women? You might have a better idea of that in the South Pacific? Yes, um, so the, the role of women in the militaries, uh, there's, a, there's quite a commitment. There has been a regional action plan on women, peace and security that the Pacific Island Forum uh, had in place uh, a number of years ago. That's ready to be revised, particularly in light of climate change impacts. Um, I do know that some militaries are, are working in a, coordinate, in a coordinated fashion um, on the WPS agenda, the Women, Peace and Security agenda, to increase the number of women uh, in uniform, but also to ensure that uh, there is gender advice um, being mainstreamed throughout their activities. So it is live. It's, it's, a, it's a very live issue at the moment. And um, there are some very strong adv advocates and activists in the NGOs and across the militaries uh, in the region. Um, yeah, that's probably as much as I can say about that. Okay. Uh, Victoria, do you have any idea about the um, US military in those islands? No, specifically Tonga, Fiji, and PNG, I, um, I'm not sure. 
how, how the U.S. military is engaging with them. There are probably some people in the audience who know more than I do about Probably. That. I know there, I think there was something going on with the U.S. Army Reserve or something like that providing workshops, but I'm not an expert on that either. So maybe somebody will help weigh in. Um, next, we have a question from uh, Will Arnest. He's a US, with the U.S. Naval War College. If commitments of aid between the U.S. and China are comparable, but the U.S. is being outspent by China in actual aid to the Pacific Islands. What does that increased Chinese impact mean for the U.S.? And how can the U.S. government best respond to China's influence in the three compact nations? Uh, who would like to go first on that? Actually, I, I would like to say one thing. I have a question actually, actually for Sandra. Sandra that sort of relates to this. When you put up the slide that showed the different aid going into the region from the different countries, um, we had Australia at the, at the top and I've seen similar slides and the US is down a bit. And it was brought to my attention, that's because a lot of US aid to particularly the North Pacific Micronesia comes from our Department of the Interior. It's not looked at as foreign aid. And I don't know whether that slide particularly uh, made that because if you look at it completely it's a lot of aid but again it's different pockets of money i just throw that out there as a point of discussion for this question okay go ahead yeah um that's entirely true um so what that slide looked at was specific um official development assistance according to the oecd DAC uh, um, classifications it it also um, has a few flaws insofar as I'm not quite sure about the methodology. I haven't dived into this, um, what the Lowy Institute has done, because a number of those uh, contributions uh, by bilateral donors are also made to the, the multilaterals. So what is the US's contribution to the UN? What is the US's contribution to the World Bank? And was that counted in that particular slide? So I, there is a lot more going on in terms of development assistance uh, to the region, including concessional loans uh, and so forth. So if you do look at the whole picture of what are the flows going into the Pacific, it probably won't look like that slide. That's just one specific classification. So it was an excellent question and it has just unpicked this nice little ball that I had put in place for you to look at. But there, I think is a number of PhDs in uncovering what the, the financial flows are, which does actually come to the point um, that was raised about uh, outspending and the competition to spend in the region. Uh, and I thought there was a, an earlier comment about buying the Pacific. I think it, it, as I said in the presentation, I think it's a little, it's, it's much, much, much more nuanced than that. And if you have a joined up agenda where you have development assistance as a diplomatic tool to guarantee the security dividends, to guarantee, um, you know, particular access to markets, it's, it plays out at the sh in short term and long term um, scenarios. So, you know, you can spend a lot of money in the region. You could, you, it, it could go everywhere, but how you use that money and if it is actually um, speaking directly to the Pacific Islands um, address needs and requirements, that's more important than anything else. The Pacific Islands have said over and over again that they are the ones that are in charge of their own development agenda that um, they are the ones who are going to be able to pick and choose thank you for all of the options they really are appreciating some of the the increased interest in the region but they are the ones that um, they own their sovereignty and they're going to be exercising it so what we can do to build that trust and maintain those relationships is listen and listen to what they're wanting, to what they're needing, and be there for the long term. That's a bit soapboxy, but that's what we can do. So it's not about you know how much people are spending. That does is a factor, but it's about building those long term trusted relationships. Thank you very much, Victoria. Would you have anything to add to that? Um, I guess I would just note that. Um, you know, a lot of the, um, I think a lot of the 
the, the spending in um, Pacific Islands um, from China tends to be infrastructure, um, as has been noted. But the the you know I would go back to this idea of the boundary organization that I was talking about as a way to more meaningfully engage and um, if you want to frame it as as countering Chinese influence, um, you know we've talked several times about the important of importance of relationships in the Pacific Islands and by meaningfully building partnerships that address the number one stated issue um, of Pacific Islands around countering climate change um, instead of just throwing money at infrastructure, um, which you know infrastructure does need to be done, uh, done especially in a climate resilient way, but by partnering with the, uh, with the Pacific Islands governments and organizations that know what need to be done instead of bringing in outside um, workers, you know, Chinese um, companies that come in and build something and take all of, um, bring in all the, the people and supplies and then leave um, afterwards uh, and don't provide any sort of training or maintenance or education, um, you know, I think is, is a, um, I think there's a better strategy in terms of partnership and, and more engagement. Thank you very much. Uh, we next have a question from Lauren Moriarty. Lauren is with the, she's a foundation, Asia Foundation trustee, member of the Pacific Forum Board of Directors and an East-West Center alumna. We'll say she's a former diplomat in residence at the East-West Center along with her husband. Um, she has an additional question regarding coordination. What systems or mechanisms are being developed or would you recommend to coordinate efforts of Pacific Island nations, your organizations and other partners of Pacific Island nations to promote synergy rather than overlaps and gaps in addressing needs? Should the work be divided geographically by sector in some, in some other ways or which way would you suggest? And oh, she also thanks you folks for doing an excellent job. Maybe I'll bring up one specific thing um, before um, asking, uh, turning it over to Sandra. Um, and that would be um, on the US front, there was very recently, um, a new uh, a new act brought up at, and it was held uh, it was um, presented by the natural resources committee in the house um, last month I believe and it was called the insular climate change act and what that did um, it was a bunch of different ways of providing more assistance across different agencies in the U.S. government um, specifically to respond to climate change in the insular areas in the Pacific. Um, and one of those things that it did propose was um, a mechanism to coordinate efforts across those different uh, government agencies. And I think that um, that would be a fantastic start to um, starting to, to get all of the different sources of aid and grants and funding um, and research initiatives and infrastructure help um, within the Pacific in a, in a more coordinated way. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to look into the Insular um, Climate Change Act. Thank you very much. Sandra? That was a big question, actually. <laughs> um, so I think potentially what I'm going to start with is that uh, regionally, we do have these fantastic regional organizations in, in the Pacific, uh, and we do have a Blue Pacific Strategy 20, 20, uh, 2050 coming out that the Pacific Island leaders um, have directed PIFs to, to undertake. And they've gone through and done drivers of change analysis in every Pacific Island country, which is then fed into this regional uh, remit, which puts the the blue pacific economy at the at the center of their strategy so um so that's taking that and and understanding what that strategy looks like and getting in and supporting that strategy is one way of um, using a systemic approach to supporting pacific island change um there are a couple of other things that can be really done as well um so um core funding to regional organizations and to ngos would be really beneficial i think as victoria pointed out before <laughs> there there's overwhelming number of meetings and calls and report requests and so forth that uh, officials uh, non-government organizations and practitioners need to do because there are so many different interests in the region. 
So if we are able to do core funding for these organizations so they can actually engage with us meaningfully um, and, and have appropriate resources to do so, we can coordinate our own approaches uh, and that will actually take some time and effort uh, and some leadership to be able to, to coordinate that. But also to be able to step into the complexity of that coordination. It's not a simple exercise on anyone's behalf to be able to do that. And it will have to come back to, and I think I made a point before of having uh, respectful um, disagreements about particular directions. You can actually have what Horta called a big tent approach to these things. Um, and before leaping into the, the, the unknown, I think it's, it's really incumbent on uh, people who are interested in the region to do their political economy analysis. Go out, have a look what's out there, listen to, to what are the, the needs and the requirements and what's worked before and what hasn't, and see where you can coordinate and harmonize uh, across various lines of efforts. So you can have systems and uh, mechanisms to do so. There are some existing, existing ones that we can tap into and harness and focus. Uh, and we also need to get our own houses in order. Thank Thanks. you very much, especially getting our own houses in order. Thank you, Sandra. Um, we next have one from uh, Mark Wall, who's a former US State Department advisor to the US PECAM, Command, PECOM, I'm sorry. Uh, Samuel Locklear, and uh, he would like to know what your thoughts are on how the United States can most effectively implement the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. It's a military question. <laughs> uh, I would probably ask Mark Wall that question. <laughs> I, uh, that, I, that would be fine. Thank you, because um, Mark, that's really important. We've been hearing about that. Um, I'm not sure, Sandra, if you have any uh, thoughts or anything about this. No, I think, Mark, that that's something that a little bit outside our area of expertise on that. But thank you very much. It was an important question. Um, next, we'll go to Bill Cole from the Asia Foundation. Um, can you say more about China's direct involvement on climate in the Pacific Islands? Which subregions, the nature of engagement, scale of cooperation with the US and Australia, or is China's involvement pursued entirely, entirely separately? And how is China, I'm sorry, and how is China's engagement perceived locally? Would you like me to repeat that? Was that a little bit rambling for you? Um, no, I, I have the, the Q&A box okay, up, so I great. can okay. follow it. A um, lot, of, lot of questions in there. Um, yeah, like I said, from what I've seen and what I know that the direct involvement of China in the Pacific Islands in terms of um, climate change is really about infrastructure and it's about bringing in um, crews of Chinese workers and Chinese supplies and everything from outside the islands region, bringing it in, doing a project um, with you know, more or less participation from, um, from different governments and then leaving afterwards. Um, and so it is, you know, kind of a really more of a parachute and do a project and leave instead of um, establish uh, any sort of training or um, upkeep or, or um, education around what the things that are being built. So for example, you know, there, um, there are islands that have um, set up uh, solar arrays and are entirely solar powered um, now. And a lot of them have um, been paid through aid funds from uh, under international donors, either Australia or the US. And um, those countries have committed to, you know, funding education and research to uh, those Pacific Islands so they can maintain and operate um, those solar arrays. So, you know, doing more engagement so that um, Pacific Islands can um, uh, be more independent in the maintenance of that infrastructure into the future, I think is, is a good strategy. Um, in terms of the scale of cooperation with the US and Australia, um, I'm not aware of any, um, any cooperation. <laughs> um, and I think it might, uh, from what I've seen, it, it's usually pursued entirely separately, but of course I don't know everything that, that's going on. And I think in terms of um, local engagement, um, how China's engagement is perceived locally, that varies upon um, the Pacific Island. Um, 
and it could be you know more positive or negative depending on um, depending on the, the region or subregion and I've seen all sorts of different um, different takes on it. Okay, thank you. Sandra, would you like to weigh in? Uh, yes. Um, so I don't know the specifics about uh, the engagement between uh, China, Australia and the US on climate change, but this is where the, the global instruments come into play, because if uh, China and Australia and New Zealand, the US are all feeding into the same global instruments, such as the GEF or such as other UN instruments, then that is a point of collaboration. And, and that's a very useful way to, to use that particular mechanism, which goes back to the point uh, made before, I think. In terms of how um, uh, Chinese are viewed locally, I think I made the point uh, in my very quick presentation that their Chinese investments in the region is not new. Uh, there has been long-standing investments uh, for some generations. Um, you have a look in the Solomon Islands and they you know, are distinguishing between the older Chinese, their Chinese, and then the new Chinese investments that are coming in as well. So it is a, it's not just a, it's a blanket approach. It, there is, it's very quite nuanced um, and it is nuanced uh, between region and countries um, and within countries. So some of it is, as Victoria said, very diplomatically, some of it's uh, viewed quite positively and some of it is viewed more negatively. And it all depends on the context and the connections. And again, the relationships that are being made and forged through these interactions. Thank you very much. We're almost out of time. Um, we have a question though from Adam Morrow and maybe Vicki, this is directed to you if you could answer fairly quickly. Um, he, Adam Morrow is with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. And he asks, you mentioned shifting uh, pelagic fisheries as one of the climate security threats in the region. How are fisheries shifting? Are migration patterns moving forward, poleward, et cetera? Go ahead. Yeah, so I saw this question coming. So I pulled up our chapter um, from the National Climate Assessment, which has some facts on it. Um, so um, in, in the higher warming scenario, so what they call RCP 8.5, which kind of is kind of um, colloquial known as the, the business as, uni as usual warming scenario, um, we're pro uh, projecting that tuna and billfish species richness and abundance in the central and western Pacific Ocean will be reduced by the end of the century, resulting in declines in fishery yields of two to 5% per decade. Um, and we're also seeing and project to continue seeing smaller fish sizes overall. Um, so they're going to be uh, you know, winners and losers, if you wanna say that in terms of you know, where fish are going to be migrating in terms of EEZs. Um, they say tuna habitat is going to be shifting eastward um, with the changing temperatures in the ocean. So that by the end of the century, um, skipjack, skipjack tuna availability within the EEZs of Micronesian countries will likely be 10 to 40% lower than they are currently. Okay, thank you. And I'm just going to quickly ask uh, Sandra the very last question by Noor Lastrina Hamid. And I'm just going to ask, she had two questions, but just, just a second one. You would have a good, um, I think, sense of this one. How do you think the future of work for women in the Pacific Islands uh, looks like in the face of climate change? Oh, I think Pacific Forum is going to answer this question live. I think we're at the end of our time. Okay, so sorry, Sandra, uh, or sorry, I think we have to wrap this up, but this has been fantastic, both of you. Thank you so very much uh, for all of your insights, your contributions. Um, thank you to all the folks who turned in, tuned in and your questions. Uh, for the military questions, um, I'm sure we will able to be able to follow up on some of those. But again, we thank both of you for your expertise and sharing your time with us. Thank you also to the Pacific Forum staff who are working behind the scenes to pull this together. And for the audience members, please stay tuned for the fourth session of the US-Australia Indo-Pacific Conversation Series happening in May. The next session will focus on Australia and the United States efforts in advancing the women peace and security agenda in the region. So please stay tuned for that. Thank you both. And thank you all for attending. And thank you, Pacific Forum. <laughs>